So we've talked about uh, basic mechanical operations in here. We see how the turret rotates, we see how the guns elevate, we see all the controls here. And because they're using remote director fire uh, past 1925-26 rebuild, you, you only needed a total of four people in this gun pit. You had the pointer and trainer sitting up here, and then further in the back of the pit were the two powder passers. But prior to that, or if for whatever reason you wanted to local fire, you had, you had two more people down here. This is where uh, some of the uh, old school magic comes in place. Now we have, again, the pointer and trainer sitting here. And if you look directly up, you can see that there and that there. Those are two holders for gun sights. Now these are telescopic sights that are also small periscopes and what they do is they look up through openings on either side of the gun sleeve below the sleeve. Let's see if we can... So the opening is right up in there. Now these are firmly attached to kind of a Y frame here. You can see attached to that and it extends back and here's the back of it into this device. If they want to fire locally and, and, and do what's called direct fire, they can do that quite easily. Now range limitation is going to, it's going to be down to something in the neighborhood of eight, six or 8,000 yards or possibly less, with whatever you can accurately aim at through the periscopic sights. Uh, but you can be extremely accurate with this. Now, what you have to also be able to do is create, correct for the drop of the shell. Just like if you're shooting a rifle long range, as you know, the bullet drops as it travels a distance. No difference here. It's just that the range is longer and the bullets are bigger. You have to correct for that drop. Now, you also, with a rifle or long range shooting, you have, you have a horizontal control that's called windage control. Now they don't call it windage here, they call it deflection because you're not really trying to correct for the wind in this case, but what you're trying to correct for is deflection. Now one thing about a shell that travels long distance, it spins and uses its gyroscopic force to remain stable so that it doesn't tumble and it stays traveling in essentially a straight line. But it doesn't really travel in a straight line because of what's called gyroscopic precession. And what this means is, over a long distance, the nose of that shell is actually going to kind of travel in a circle. And what it does is then that shell will actually move like this. And as it comes around, it comes back. So you have to correct for that. Well, these, these were angles of deflection based on range have been very closely calculated in the, in the test grounds. So where they know that it, by eliminating all other variables, how much that shell is going to deflect at any given range. This is where the sight setter comes in. Now there are two sight setters uh, that set back right where, about where I'm sitting right now, and they operated this mechanism. Now, what this mechanism did was it adjusted those sights for both the pointer and the trainer so that all they had to worry about was keeping the crosshairs of that sight directly on the target. Any corrections for elevation or deflection were done by the sight setter. And the way he would do that is he would look down here at this device that shows range and deflection. And this information came down from the... From the um, directors, the gun directors, um, on the, up on the mass, or you could actually use a range finder. With that you could determine range and then they could send down uh, the amount of deflection. If you were using the range finder in the turret, then you had to use a chart or a table that uh, can be found riveted or screwed to the inside of some of these turrets to determine how much deflection to crank in. Now, the way this worked is that this, this frame that the two sight brackets are mounted on that travels back here, you have a range arc, and by cranking the handle on this side, it actually moves this entire frame up or down, which in turn rotates those sights up or down to correct 
for elevation. Then you had a ballistics or deflection drum here. And let's see if I can move over a little bit. And it shows the amount of deflection to crank in. And you would use this handle. And when you crank it, it actually moves the uh, mount sideways. In fact, you can see the little bearing block up there. Again, with the range, uh, this they would crank it. And this is where they'd be looking for the correct range to crank in. So with that, this tilts the, uh, the sights up or down or moves them left to right. And that way, then the, it's the sight setter's responsibility to make sure that those sights are set precisely correct. Now, one other thing is if the, uh, if the gun is to be fired locally, it was done by the pointer. You can see there's a grip here. There's that brown cylindrical grip there. It has a thumb button on top. And there's another one down here. And that's what he would use to fire the gun. Now, it's assumed that usually for horizontally mounting, the ship's not going to move around that much. It might be a little bit, but the uh, trainer will do his best to try to keep this, that gun centered on that. The big thing is that the ship, either rocking or rolling, those sights are going to move up and down quite a bit. So, this is where the trainer's skill really, I'm sorry, the pointer's skill really comes in because he's going to be watching that target uh, move up and down in his sights. And at the exact moment that those sights cross his point of aim, he pushes the, he squeezes both firing uh, keys and fires the gun. This is the way it was done all the way up through uh, uh, up into the early 20s when they started uh, trying more and more director fire. And the pointer had to have a very high skill level 